Okay, well, let's jump into the content for this first session, for session one, really looking after flight instruments. And uh, as an instrument pilot, this is a great place to start. This is where test prep from Glime starts as well, uh, understanding our flight instruments. This is what you'll be looking at an awful lot as an instrument pilot. So you want to be intimately knowledgeable uh, about them. And as I said before, now how do they work and how do they fail if they're going to fail? How can I recognize that? And what can I do about that? So name these instruments first off. Um, let's start in the top left, the most important instrument I would say in the cockpit with number one. And we have them labeled A, B, C, D through F uh, just for our reference point. But instrument A here is our airspeed indicator, usually typically in knots, nautical miles per hour. And then B, if you said attitude indicator or artificial horizon, you're absolutely correct. And this is the analog. You may certainly be flying a uh, an airplane that has glass, a glass cockpit, which will be a little different look at than this. But we're going to start off this way, and we'll talk a little bit about glass, but mostly about the analog at this point. Um, and then next door to that, C is altimeter. If you said altimeter, you're absolutely right. And then below that, F is our VSI, vertical speed indicator. Next to that E is our heading indicator or DG, directional gyro. And then D is our what? Turn coordinator. Okay, turn coordinator, two, two for one special. In this case, we've got the um, rate of turn information up here with the little miniature airplane. And then we've got the ball or the inclinometer, fancy word for it. And um, that's our six traditional six pack of, of instrument. Now, what source of power powers these different instruments? Okay, that's something as a private pilot you needed to know. And maybe we have forgotten. Usually by this point, depends how many years it's been since you've been in, in the training. But um, let's refresh that knowledge as well. Okay, so let's start back up here. Now, the airspeed indicator works off of the pitot-static system, right? It's a pressure, there's a pressure-sensitive wafer inside that instrument. Actually, that instrument has it, and so does the altimeter, and so does the VSI, the vertical speed indicator. They all have pressure-sensitive wafers um, in there that expand or contract due to pressure changes. We're going to look into that in more detail in just a moment. So if you're kind of thinking, boy, it's been a while, I remember vaguely about that stuff, we're going to review it. Okay, and we're going to understand it even probably better than you did before. Um, but the airspeed indicator is the only one that used both pedo and static. Okay, the altimeter used static pressure only, and the VSI static pressure only. That is the outside ambient air pressure let in through the static port. Okay, wherever that comes in from your airplane, little tiny port on the uh, on the aircraft. The other three instruments here, what these all have in common. B, E, and D is that they're all gyros, right? In the, again, non-glass version here as we're looking at analog instruments. And what a gyro does is it spins at a high speed and it remains rigid in space, okay? It has some gyroscopic properties that are very helpful. And, but you got to spin the gyro. How do you spin it? Well, there's different ways to do that. One of them is vacuum. It's hard to read it on this one, but this says vacuum. And that definitely says vacuum. So these two instruments here, both gyros again, but they're spun, the gyros are spun via, via vacuum. Okay, so there is a vacuum pump on the airplane, usually engine-driven vacuum pump, typically. Now over here, our turn coordinator, not the ball, that's, that's sustained by itself, kind of like a carpenter's level. But the turn coordinator part, the rate of turn information, is a gyro as well. And it's operated, you got it right here, DC elect, direct current electrical. Okay, so when you turn the master switch on, you hear that little winding up sound, that's what that is. Okay, so there's just a little review on our uh, our power source for these instruments. Of course, up here is our sometimes lonely compass, very, very simple instrument, uh, which has just got a north seeking magnet in it. And it's submerged in some fluid, some kerosene, and then sits on a pivot and twists around and it's a very simple, simple instrument. Now let's look a little bit more in detail then of the pedostatic system. Again, starting as a review, and then we'll kind of move a little bit, uh, a little deeper into the failure modes that could, you could possibly expect. So our pedo tube, of course, is usually sitting out on our wing somewhere, and it's just accepting the ram air pressure, we call it, or the dynamic pressure. The faster the airplane is moving, the more air is going into the pedo tube. 
which again we call ram air pressure. And you can see that's the only instrument, as I said, that takes any air from the pitot tube. The rest of them use static only. But the airspeed indicator, remember, also used the static pressure from the static port. So it's the only one that uses both. And again, the vertical speed and the altimeter only use static pressure. Now, we also have two other uh, switches or knobs to talk about that are important, especially as an IFR pilot. And one is the, the pitot heat switch, which you may probably have not used as a VFR pilot, but now it's very important to know about its place in the cockpit, where it is, and even test it in your pre-flight to make sure it works. Why? Because this pitot tube's sticking right out into that wind, and if you're IFR and perhaps picking up ice, now we hope that you will stay out of the ice, especially if you don't have an aircraft equipped to handle the ice. But if we did get into those kind of conditions, well, we have some uh, options. One, we can use the pitot heat switch to at least um, heat up the pitot tube so that the ice won't form or that if it did form it will melt and we can get an airspeed indication because if that tube becomes completely blocked with ice we're going to have a problem with our airspeed indicator. We'll talk about that in just a moment. We also want to have another option, a plan B for the static port. Okay, What if the static port somehow gets compromised? Now Typically, that, that port is not um, directly in line with the relative wind. It's, it's sideways to it, so it doesn't get pressurized. It's just trying to sample the outside still air, ambient air pressure. Okay. Um, but if there were to be excessive uh, dirt or an accumulation of uh, debris or contaminants of some kind, that could eventually compromise the pitot, or excuse me, the uh, static port. So we have a backup to that. We have an alternate static option in the cockpit. It might look different for different types of airplanes, but generally that's going to be there. And so you can pull that. And now you'll be actually um, sourcing the pressure, outside air pressure through your cabin, not outside. So there'll be a little change of, of, uh, of a pressure difference there between what's outside and what's inside the cabin. Let's look now at each individual instrument in the pitot-static system. Okay. First up, we did talk about the airspeed indicator. Now, I'm not going to talk about necessarily how to read it as much. I'm assuming we got that down. But let's talk about the instrument and what it looks like. So here's a little cutaway. right? Here's a little view of what it look, could look like in the analog airspeed indicator. There's that wafer we talked about, this diaphragm that expands and contracts due to uh, pressure changes. Okay. Now, notice we said that we have ram air pressure coming into the pitot tube, and that directly goes inside of the wafer, blowing it up like a balloon. Okay, And the more the wafer expands, the greater the airspeed will be. Okay, As the wafer contracts, the less airspeed you'll have. So that's just basically a simple explanation of that. There's a series of, of gears and arms that move uh, between the, the wafer itself and the actual needle. Now notice the static airline is also playing some role here and it's bled it's hard to see in this uh, picture but it's bled inside the uh, inside the casing around the wafer so it surrounds the wafer it's not going into the wafer as it might look like it's just going into the case so we have the ram air pressure from the pitot tube going inside the wafer and we have the static air pressure outside the wafer in the casing this provides a little bit of like a checks and balance type of system okay think about why why we need to do this now Let's say that we take off and we fly and we climb up. And as we climb up, remember the air pressure is changing. What is going on as you climb up? Is the air pressure increasing or is it decreasing? Now, if you said it's decreasing, you're absolutely right. All right? There's less air pressure as we go uh, up. Now, here's a problem. If we only had ram air pressure from the pitot tube, because at first that would make sense. Hey, the faster I go, the more air is getting jammed into that tube, and I'll get more airspeed. That, that makes great sense until you figure on now you're up at 8,000 feet, and there's a lot less air pressure. If we're changing altitudes, I could have changing airspeeds, and that airspeed indicator is not going to be accurate. So we need to have static or ambient air pressure around. Why? Well, because if I go up to 8,000 feet, and we just said we have a lot less air pressure inflating that diaphragm now, but we also have less air pressure outside the wafer in the case. So it will help to kind of 
balance that pressure change overall because there's less air pressure going inside the wafer there's also less air pressure outside the wafer so the expansion of the wafer will will go will be more as it should be consequently if we descend now and come back down well we should descend what what goes up needs to come down takeoffs are what optional but landings are what mandatory that's just for fun um, now as we come down the pressure is increasing and you could say, well, now the ram air pressure is getting stronger. There's more pressure in that tube that would move the diaphragm, showing more than we really have on the airspeed indicator, showing us going faster than we really are. But now we also are getting more air pressure in the casing around the instrument, which is kind of holding that wafer back from expanding, over-expanding, if you will and keeping it in check. So the static air pressure really is a checks and balances. It keeps the wafer in check so that it's moving more appropriately to what our speed is actually doing. Okay, so that, that may be some review for you. Maybe you didn't hear that kind of explanation before and it makes a little bit more sense, I hope, now how essentially the airspeed indicator works and why it needs both, you know, pitot tube, ram air pressure, and outside static air pressure to kind of do its, do its job. When we pre-flight the airplane as an IFR pilot, we want to certainly make sure that the ports are open. You know, our static port is free and clear. Get right down there and eyeball it and look in there. Make sure there's no little miniature spiders, that it's a perfect home for them. Uh, and as well as, your, you know, pitot tube. Make sure that it is open. And I would also highly recommend that you test the pitot heat switch as well. Um, in the pre-flight, that is before you take off pre-takeoff check really is that the indicator indicates zero at rest okay it's not stuck at some value but it's zero and very important too that it comes alive on takeoff run so as soon as you're advancing the throttle you got you, you're moving your rudder pedals you're you're getting some directional control established glance on over and I have a call out that I like my students to say when that is airspeed alive okay airspeed alive because if it's not coming alive and there's a delay there I might have a problem I might have some fluid in the line or some some blockage or something that's going on there now let's talk about failure modes you're gonna really need to understand this as an instrument pilot for your written test as well as for your practical test you're gonna be asked this question a lot so um, let's go through different uh, points of failure here first off let's say that the ram air portion is blocked in other words our pitot tube has got maybe ice on it. That would be more of the more common ones. I uh, certainly hope you didn't fly into a big fat bird and shish kebab the bird. Um, but nonetheless, we have a uh, blockage here. And what would happen? Okay. Well, one thing we didn't talk about is that your pitot tube will have a drain hole somewhere on the bottom, usually. It's a tiny pinhole. Okay. And so that acts as, you know, moisture goes into the pitot tube and needs to escape. It needs to leave. And you're going to be more than likely flying in rain and precip as an instrument pilot. So there's going to be a lot of stuff collecting. There's a lot of precip in there and it needs to get out. So that drain hole is that, just that. It's a drain hole. Okay. But here's the thing. If the pitot tube, front of the pitot tube is plugged, your drain hole is still open. What's going to happen? That pressure that's in the line is going to run out the bottom of the drain hole, isn't it? And your pressure will go to zero and your airspeed will go to zero. So one of the ways you know you have a blocked pitot tube, but a, a drain hole that's open is your airspeed will just whoosh, essentially go to zero. Okay. So as a flight instructor or on a written test, if say your airspeed goes to zero, you should be able to answer that the other way, the backwards. Okay. Or tell me what happens when the pitot tube gets plugged. A good question to ask that person is, is the drain hole open? And they will know immediately you're well prepared. Okay. Now, let's say that the drain hole is also plugged. I mean, that was a big, fat bird that you hit, right? Or a, a massive amount of ice that's collecting up, and that wouldn't be really good as well. But if for whatever reason, and maybe there's some debris or such that collected on that uh, drain hole over time and it hadn't been checked or cleaned. So we've got a real problem here. Well, now the pressure is certainly trapped into the wafer, isn't it? Okay. Assuming it can't get out, it can't escape at all. We have a trapped fixed pressure, all right, which will give us a certain fixed airspeed. 
Now one thing is for sure, just from a practical level, let me walk you through, I like to walk you through some thought processes so that you're not just memorizing the right answer. Most people say, well, it acts like an altimeter now, you know. But if I ask them about it and say, well, tell me more about that. What does that mean it acts like an altimeter and why? I find many times the student, instrument student pilots are not so prepared to answer that question. They don't really know why. So that's why I take the time to kind of explain this to you. Okay, so let's look at what's going on here. If I have a blocked, completely blocked pitot uh, tube, my pressure is fixed. If I just set, you know, increase the speed, let's say I increase power, I'm wanting to run, go a little faster, or I need to slow down. Maybe ATC has given me a speed restriction and I need to slow down but keep the altitude. I'm going to know something's up right away because you know what? nothing's going to change on the airspeed indicator. It's going to stay the same. Say I was cruising at 100 knots, just to make it easy here. 100 knots. And uh, AC, ATC said, uh, give me uh, 80 knots, please. 80 knots. Okay. Reach up for the throttle, pull back a little bit, pitch up a little, trim up a little, do all those things. You can feel the speed changing. You can hear the wind noise changing. Um, you know you're flying a little slower. You can feel it in the controls. But you look over at your airspeed indicator, it still says 100 probably more than likely you have a completely blocked pitot tube and drain hole okay now what if you just maybe you didn't do any kind of power change but you decided to do an altitude change maybe ATC said climb and maintain a new altitude or descend and maintain a new altitude well if I pitch up power up trim up start climbing I immediately expect an airspeed change pretty quickly don't I there might be a couple second delay there but I'm gonna start to see that going down as we're going uphill now and say climbing right well I'm not going to get an airspeed change am I why again because our pressure is trapped in the wafer so the airspeed will look frozen that's essentially what's going to happen whether I make a speed change on altitude or I'm making an altitude change the airspeed indicator will appear to be frozen maybe I'll go well that's strange and I'll pitch up a little higher I want to be careful here we won't want to stall the airplane but as I pitch up a little higher I notice it's still stuck on 100 knots I have got a blocked pitot and drain uh, situation. Now, what's interesting is your static is not blocked in this case. Static line is open. So the pressure around the wafer is free to change, and it is changing. So as we go up, what's happening in the case? As I go up, pressure goes down, right? Okay. If you said down, you're right. And if the pressure is going down, then what's going to happen to the wafer? There's a fixed pressure inside that's expanded it already to give us 100 knots. But now there's less pressure around the wafer, so the wafer is free to what? Expand more. So it'll expand more, and it'll show a little more airspeed. And it's gradual, mind you. It's not going to be something really fast or obvious. But as you climb higher and higher, so gradually your airspeed indicator will start to move up. 101, 102, 103. Pretty soon, 105, and it'll be it'll be obviously very strange, but that's what's happening, and that's why we say an airspeed acts like an altimeter in this case. If you have a blocked um, pitot tube, the drain hole and the pitot opening are both blocked, it'll act like an altimeter. As you go up, altitude, uh, the airspeed will go up. As you go down, airspeed will go down, albeit very gradual. Again, take the descent into mind. Now you descend. Again, the pressure is fixed inside the wafer. There's a certain amount there. And as we descend, air pressure increases in the case from the static line. And that exerts pressure on the wafer, contracting the wafer. And the airspeed will be ever so slightly less. I hope that makes sense. I take the a little extra time to explain that because, again, we want you to understand it, not just be able to spit out the right answer. Okay, now let's turn it around and say that the pitot tube is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay, it's the static line that's plugged up. Let's run through that scenario. Well, let's start by increasing or decreasing our power at a certain uh, airspeed. And if I do that in this case, I add power, well, I'm going to go faster and it's going to show up as faster. Why? Because that pitot tube is completely clearer. The static line really is only there as that check and balance, as we said, for changing altitudes. So as long as we're at a constant altitude, we change airspeeds, it's going to look fine. 
but as soon as we change altitudes we're going to get some differences here so let's run through it let's go up okay as we climb up what's happening well we know this that so we talked about earlier that we're getting less air pressure less dynamic pressure into the wafer so that would tend to contract the wafer as we go up which would show a slower airspeed but normally the static pressure in the casing is also less so it won't contract the wafer too much and my airspeed will be more correct but in this case the pressure in the in the casing around the wafer is trapped at a higher pressure why because at a lower altitude is when the blockage occurred so if you're following what I'm trying to say there is if we're at a thousand feet we're in the pattern okay and everything's fine and honky dory and all of a sudden we do have now a plugged static port as we climb to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 feet the air pressure in the case is trapped at a thousand feet that's a higher pressure isn't it and so it's going to be exerting pressure to contract that wafer you have less air pressure going in the pitot tube already plus you have the higher pressure around the wafer contracting it more than it should be we're going to register a slower speed than we're actually going which probably if we don't really recognize yet what's happening we will pitch the nose down a little to increase that speed to what looks right to us so we'll be flying a shallower climb gradient and wonder man why is this plane not climbing that well why is my VSI so low let's take it from the other the other way let's say you're up at a higher altitude where the static line gets compromised and we're coming down so we have we're up at a higher altitude let's say we're cruising at we'll use 8,000 feet again we're cruising at 8,000 feet we're now stepping down and as we do that there's more air pressure at lower altitudes and so this that's inflating the wafer trying to make it expand and even show more speed than we're really doing right but the problem is in normal conditions the again the static pressure inside the case would be increasing too keeping that wafer from expanding too far and giving us too much speed that would be incorrect well that's not happening now because that air pressure is trapped at a higher altitude which means the air pressure in the case is lower which means that the wafer is allowed to expand too far it doesn't have the check and balance of the static pressure so as we go down there's more air molecules more pressure that's going inside the pitot tube expanding our wafer too far and nothing's there to stop it because the air pressure in the case is trapped at 8,000 feet which is a low pressure so that allows the wafer again to expand and swell a little too far so our airspeed will be faster will indicate faster than we're actually doing now think about those two scenarios getting the static port trapped at low altitude going up or getting it trapped at high altitude going down which one do you think is more critical which one do you think might be more dangerous if you said being up at higher altitude coming down when a trap occurs when the blockage occurs you're right because having an airspeed indicator registering more speed than we're doing is more dangerous isn't it because what are you gonna do if you're going too fast you're gonna slow down you're gonna power back you're gonna pitch up because it looks like you're going too fast and remember if you're coming down ultimately you're coming down to land so once you get in the landing mode and you put out the flaps you put out the drag you're slowing the plane down you're getting down to approach speeds your margin between your speed and your stall speed is a lot less and so it's not a great thing to have your airspeed indicator showing you going too fast because you'll slow down and the horn might just chirp a little bit on that stall horn we've got to be very very careful so that is the more critical one so I hope that makes sense when we talk about the pedostatic system the instruments that affect are affected by the pedostatic system how the airspeed in general works and does its job and what would happen if the pedo or the static ports uh, get get plugged now once you're armed with that kind of knowledge and you may need to go back and just replay that a little bit and just listen to that again and kind of work yourself through it I find it's helpful to think like the airspeed indicator to run it through the logical paces I just uh, gave you it can help to understand it we're gonna have some questions in just a little bit um, that we'll take a look at from the test prep guide from Glime. That's the one I'll use typically. Um, and we'll uh, cover that in just a little bit. But next, let's go to the altimeter. Altimeter is a little more simple instrument than the airspeed in the sense that it only uses outside, outside static pressure only. 
Okay, there's no ram air pressure. The pitot tube does nothing for the altimeter. All we need to know is as we go up, the pressure goes down and vice versa. So the altimeter is going to think that way. The altimeter really has no idea about your altitude. It just knows pressure and it equates certain pressure changes to certain altitude changes.